You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'll do what Frank did. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that <clears throat> really nice introduction. Of course, thank you to uh, elders Frank and Barb for the for the prayer and Sherry for the uh, for the land acknowledgement and the reminder around our treaty uh, relationship. It's good to see MP Brad Redekop here, and you know it goes without saying. I think MPs deal with a lot of issues. I think that's fair to say. Um, but I, I know that the piece around uh, immigration, workforce development, newcomer settlement, that's a really important one to MP Redekop. He, he uses a lot of his time on the floor of the House of Commons asking questions around that. We appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Brad. And of course, um, to Sherry in a seat for leading the charge on our local immigration partnership um, initiatives. You know, Sherry is, you know, the leader. I mean, the leader. When, you know, when you've been involved in the United Way movement as long as, as Sherry has, um, you know, Sherry has mobilized this community to do big things for a very long time. So we're very grateful that you're, you're chairing this particular piece in a seat that goes without saying, I think, you know, I think you'd be in the same camp. Your leadership at the university for years and then within our chamber and business community has been just outstanding. And so we're really grateful to have the two of you uh, leading the charge on this one. So thank you very much. Um, it is my pleasure to be here on behalf of the, uh, the Saskatoon Chamber. We were the biggest business network in the city. We have uh, 1,500 member businesses and organizations. Uh, and we're the, biggest, uh, we're the biggest chamber in the province of Saskatchewan. The, the Saskatchewan Chamber doesn't have as many business members as, as we do. So when we talk about what's affecting Saskatoon, I, I know I'm not supposed to say this out loud, but it's a friendly room, so I, I will say. We're talking about what's happening in Saskatoon. We're talking about what's happening in the province of Saskatchewan, right? Saskatoon is the economic engine of this province. And there's very little that happens in this province or doesn't happen in this province if it's not happening or not happening here. So the leadership that uh, uh, our uh, L LIP is providing on this particular piece, I think is really important. Um, Jasmine and, and Becky, I know, worked very hard on the development of this guidebook. And so all credit to the two of you for making it happen. I, I can only imagine how overwhelming and dizzying it must be to navigate a new community, let alone, um, you know, all the steps required for obtaining employment in regulated professions and in the trades. Of all of the things that you've got to think about <laughs> as you're trying to make sense of your new environment, your new community, uh, on top of having to navigate pretty complex and challenging employment uh, environments, that's got to be at the top of the list. So this resource guidebook is, is really key. I think it's going to be invaluable for the individuals using it. And I can tell you, and um, I want to spend my time here talking to you about how valuable it'll be from the point of view of, of employers who need people to fill those roles that they need filled uh, to grow and expand and, and capture the opportunities that are here. There's no doubt that opportunity is knocking here in Saskatoon, right? And across the province, but my bias will be Saskatoon. Opportunity is knocking. Um, after a, a couple of very difficult years for all of us, um, we are, we're, we're sort of crawling out of this, this experience. And quite unlike a lot of other places in the country, what we have on our immediate horizon is really something. It's really something. When you look at the amount of capital investment that's flowing into this province here over the next period of time, it really is, it's, it, the, the numbers are so huge that it's actually hard to sort of wrap your head around and really appreciate. And we, we know some of these because they're the big ones, right? We know about BHP, right? We know $12 billion investment. It's the biggest one in the province's history. It's a stone's throw from Saskatoon. A lot of those good jobs will be in that area around sort of Humboldt. Um, but BHP has made no secret of the fact that Saskatoon will be its home base for a lot of those technical and corporate level positions. Uh, Series Global uh, Ag, 350 million. This is an integrated canola crushing facility in Northgate. Nutrien has talked at length about 
these sort of record production targets in light of uh, what's happening in Eastern Europe uh, as a result of Russian aggression, the need to find ways to increase production to support the food needs of growing communities and markets all over the world. They're going to need people, skilled people, above and below ground to get that done. Cameco, resumption of operations in northern uh, mills and mines, and of course hiring at its headquarters in Saskatoon. Engineers, accountants, project managers, safety officers, goes on and on. Vendasta, so let's get out of the, the mines and the minerals for a minute and talk about coding, <laughs> data, um, technology, right? Vendasta is a leader in its own space. It's also a beachhead for our tech hub. And then you look at the companies like Siemens, Se uh, Seven Ships, uh, uh, Sed Systems, and other leaders in our tech space that are crying out for talented and skilled, and in some cases, credentialed and certified people. Viterra, Cargill, Richardson International, again, multi-million dollar commitments to infrastructure. Redleaf Pulp, One Sky Forest Products, Paper Excellence, all leading the charge on the development of local forest and egg byproducts to manufacture pulp and, and paper and packaging products. Again, engineers, accountants, project managers, manufacturing specialists, it goes on and on. Companies like Foreign Mining, Vital Minerals, Prairie Lithium, we've heard a lot about critical minerals. The federal government has made a, a, a series of strategic investments. The Saskatchewan Research Council, and in particular, the province of Saskatchewan has stepped up in a big way. This is an area of emerging opportunity for our province. All of those industries, all of those sectors are going to require skilled and qualified people who are well credentialed and capable of, of, of doing the job. And then, it, of course, let's take it out of, uh, you know, the private sector for a minute. The spectrum of health career opportunities that are now presenting to us are, is just absolutely huge. And so when you think about uh, skilled and credentialed people that are needed across all of the specialized programs, the professional roles from doctors and nurses and LPNs to diagnostic technologists. Those are all jobs that are going to require people. So, since there's a theme here, we have all of this need and we don't have the people to fill those roles. It is really troubling to me personally and I'm sure for many, when I see a question that says, I've applied 20 times to an employer, I just don't understand that. I don't understand how we can have employers in this community who are aching for skilled talent and they've got it in their line of sight and for whatever reason, they're not grabbing it. That's why this kind of, this kind of conversation, this kind of um, initiative is so important. Um, and I have taken notes. We're going to have to do something on the employer front. This doesn't make any sense. When you have this much opportunity and you've got skilled talent hiding in plain sight and putting up its hand to make a contribution, it seems weird that we can't, we can't make this match happen. So are we going to have enough people to answer the call? All of these companies that I just ran through and even the, the health career spectrum I just mentioned, Skilled talent, credentialed and certified people, and ready now. So, how bad is it <laughs> in terms of tapping this resource? I don't know if any of you caught the, there was an RBC report that was issued just, I think it was like Thursday last week, and it caught my attention because I knew I was coming to this today. Um, and it's, it's a report on, effectively, the underutilization of immigrants to Canada. The extent to which there are skilled and capable and job-ready people ready to grasp the, the jobs and the roles that we need filled. And for whatever reason, um, Canadian companies are not, are not picking up that opportunity. So, for example, Canada leads the G7 in attracting immigrants. And I, I didn't know that until this, this report came out. The U.S. used to dominate that, that metric. Um, and then parts of Europe did for a long time, but now we lead the G7. We have more immigration than any other G7 country, with newcomers now driving 90% of our population growth. 90% of Canada's population growth is attributed to immigration. Immigrants that come to Canada, we know, are well-educated and they're career-ready. 
Over one third, according to this study, over one third have advanced degrees. That's a bachelor's degree or higher. Compared to just over one fifth of non-immigrants. So compared to Canadians, domestic Canadians who are already here, the domestic workforce, one fifth have those advanced degrees. Immigrants, it's one third. In other words, more of them tend to work in occupations that require education and training that's below their current level. So the bottom line is we need to figure out a better way to utilize immigrant skills because we have to acknowledge that it'll be key to our economic prosperity. We, we have to figure this out. Um, proper integration of, of, of their skills will obviously address the workforce uh, and worker shortages. Uh, it certainly helps our small and medium sized business community grow bigger, faster, um, and ultimately, it'll generate the economic activity uh, that we want to see in every sector. You know, part of this conversation is always around filling a role or filling a job. And that's really important because there's nothing better in terms of an economic stimulus than filling a job. A job is an economic stimulus. It's really, really important. Partly because the person in that job who's now earning and contributing is buying things, you know, they're going out, they're supporting um, a whole ecosystem of small and medium-sized businesses in that local community, which feels the buzz and feels the energy of that economic activity. But it doesn't happen unless somebody's drawing a paycheck and is in a job. So it's not just about, ah, you know, we should really try and find some folks some work. If we're serious about our city's capacity to grow from an economic point of view, it's got to start with getting people in jobs who are earning and contributing back. And so there's some new measures that the province has introduced over the last, um, I guess, eight months since the throne speech. And they're really good initiatives. And they're ones that we had an opportunity to provide some feedback on when they were being contemplated. Um, one is the proposed um, Saskatchewan Immigration Accord. And you might recall, this is the act and the regulations that are that will give Saskatchewan a, a, a bit more flexibility and capacity to nominate newcomers moving to our province, um, which would effectively allow us to double the number of newcomers uh, that we're able to welcome uh, from the current model. The current model's capped at, I think, 6,000, and I think under the legislation, they're thinking that could be more than doubled to 13,000 on an, on an annual basis. And that would be huge to help our small and medium-sized enterprises um, recruit into a, a, a larger and more diverse um, talent pool. So that's great. The other bit was around the, um, the Labor Mobility and Fair Registration Act. You might remember or you will have read that it will require now regulatory bodies a maximum of 50 days to assess internationally trained applicants' training and experience and credentials. And if for whatever reason they are not moving through that process, then a practical strategy to help them be successful and get on with it. Um, this notion that somebody's churning in a certification and credentialing process endlessly is a huge waste. It's a huge waste of their talent and time, and it's a huge opportunity cost for the employer that would desperately love to be able to bring that type of individual on board. And then, of course, there's, uh, there's also a grant now that's being offered for international credential recognition, and that's to assist newcomers with foreign qualification recognition costs, which can be, I know, very expensive. And at a time when you're trying to secure employment, and now you're, you're being asked to pay hundreds of dollars to participate in the certification or the credentialing that you need to get the employment and apply 20 times and hopefully get down the path, that is a hardship that is not... Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And so it's really good that there's this kind of support as well. So I mention all, these, all of these initiatives and this need um, because I think this guidebook is a great complement to those things. I, I think this guidebook would be a great opportunity to complement those initiatives to accelerate credential and certification um, recognition. It's obviously, uh, you know, it provides a map and a pathway uh, for skilled newcomers to participate faster and more fully in our economy. And of course, uh, an opportunity for employers to leverage locally available talent sooner. And as I've said, I don't think the urgency could be more, could, could be stronger. We have got to figure this out. 
or these opportunities that I mentioned off the top are going to sail past us. They just will. Um, so our, our economic prospects are bright. I can tell you that the, the businesses and the members that I represent are very optimistic. Uh, they feel very good about what lies ahead for our community and certainly for their, their employees and their, their businesses. Um, to seize those opportunities right in front of us, we'll need people who are, who are, who are ready who are ready to help. And so this guidebook will be a very important tool in that effort. And we can't thank the, uh, the Immigration Partnership uh, Saskatoon group enough for their leadership on this. We have some work to do. And like I said, we've taken some notes. And I, I, think, I think it'll be time in short order to turn our attention to employers. Um, and whatever costs, complexity, or risks they're concerned about when it comes to this process, we've got to figure out a way to to sort of beat those down and convince them that it's not as costly, as complex, or as risky to go down this path if they want to do it. So thanks for your time today. Congratulations to the, to the group on this great book. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Oh my god. I got to flip a tab. You flip a tab. I have no I have no technology competency whatsoever. I I'll confess in this room at you know when we had VCRs. Yeah. Mine blinked 12 for 8 years. I never even knew how to set the clock on the VCR. Yeah, so I'm not the guy to be flipping a tab here at the at the podium. Does the chamber have plans for new? Hmm, very good question. The answer is yes. The challenge is the data and the information. Um, we've changed our own internal processes when it comes to uh, onboarding new member businesses to ask people if they would identify as a newcomer business. And if we, if we know that, then we can do, we can do things with it. Uh, one of the challenges is that, and I understand this, sometimes newcomers do not want to do that. What they, you know, what they seek is to is to feel included in the mainstream business community and therefore don't necessarily want to do that. But if there's an opportunity for us to know, it makes it much easier for us to provide any kind of support or connect those newcomer businesses with other newcomer businesses. I know a lot of that help uh, happens within sort of cultural communities, right? It just so happens that a business owner might be a part of the same sort of cultural community that their families are involved with. And so that sort of networking or that kind of support is offered there. But as a chamber, uh, we'd like to get to a point where we could actually um, connect newcomers and help them navigate um, how challenging it can be to be a business owner in this environment. Because on top of all the complexity we've talked about, oh my goodness. I mean, I've lived here my whole life. English is my first language. Some of the stuff I get in terms of my tax bill and my EI requirements and my GST and PST remittances and all of that stuff. Even I get confused on that stuff. I can't imagine what it's like when English is a second or third language and you've just now opened a business in this, in this community. So one of our strategic goals at the Chamber is to build a more inclusive Chamber network. Um, and that not only applies to newcomer businesses, but it applies to Indigenous and women-owned businesses as well. And that's, that's one of our strategic goals over the next three years. Oh. Ah, okay, yeah. I've just had a, this is a, this is a sticky one. Um, I recently spoke with a newcomer who had applied 20 times to something. And uh, it wasn't 20, I think it was 10, but they were coming up empty all the time. And in the course of that conversation, I asked, you know, what was your experience like um, at the interview stage? What did that, like, let's just go right to the, right to the place where this hiring decision was going to be made. And they said that they felt like the questions weren't um, drawing on them the depth of their experience. And in fact, in some cases, when they were asked, and we always, you know, these interview questions, there'd be... Look at HR guys, behavioral descriptive. Describe a time 
when your team completely collapsed around you and you had to find a way forward. You know, one of those? Okay, so great. Um, you get a question like that, and the newcomer I was speaking with said, that's great, all of my experiences, work and otherwise, are in my home country. And contextually, it may not, you, you may not get what I'm talking about, so I'm, I'm reluctant to use those experiences. So in that moment, I'm deciding, do I make up an experience that sounds like a Canadian kind of experience, or do I just not answer it? But either way, you're, you're in an interview setting that's been designed as sort of a, a generic, and, and of course you do this because you want to be able to weigh people equally, you want to ask the same sort of questions according to the rubric and all that good stuff. But it's very possible that employers or hiring managers in small businesses don't know how to interview a newcomer to the extent that they could, get, they could get the information out. So what they do is they just pull out the same sheet they ask every, you know. So it's not about, it's not about an accommodation. It, I, it's not about um, making it easier. Uh, you know, it, it can be as robust or rigorous. It's just, it should, be, it should be more reflective of the individual sitting across the table. And that is why I think SMEs are watching good people go out the door. Because in that moment where they're supposed to be extracting intelligence in terms of the type of person and the skill set and, and the, the competencies of that person, um, they're blowing it because they're asking the wrong question in the wrong way. And so I think part of our opportunity with employers is maybe to look at a series of maybe workshops that it's not just about global diversity, equity and inclusion themes, but it's bread and butter. What you know, what does this process need to look like from the point of view of onboarding newcomers into your company? And it starts with an interview and reference kind of process that acknowledges that it may be different than what you would normally use uh, for all of your other hiring. So, so that's top of mind. That's top of mind for us. Oh my God. What is, are these real questions or did you guys just see these? Okay, all right, okay, all right, I'm just kidding. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, the Canadian experience piece is, is a, I mean, Tiago made a really good point on that. I, I don't know to what extent that is a, a significant requirement in a lot of processes. It might have been, you, you, I think you mentioned the city of Saskatoon might have had that at some point. Or you hear a lot about it. So I, that would be interesting to kind of take a bit of a an audit and see. Okay, like is this is this a common practice across across the community? And if so, why? And is this one of is this one of the barriers that is denying people from connecting with really outstanding? candidates, uh, as opposed to getting screened out right away, right? Right, 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 right. But I think it's, you know, that whole Canadian experience piece is speaks to some of the risk that I think a smaller, medium-sized business owner will have. And I, I'm saying small and medium-sized because generally speaking, these, these businesses, these companies do not have HR departments. They may not even have an HR expert on staff. Um, the larger companies do, so they're well resourced and supported. But for a lot of a lot of uh, small and medium sized businesses, they do not have that kind of capacity. And I think it'd be interesting to drill down to figure out why that is seen as a way of screening out risk, because I have heard from owners in that segment. They're, one, they're concerned about the extent to which that newcomer will be able to feel and culturally adapt to the workplace environment. They, they obviously don't want a scenario where someone is onboarded and feeling isolated or um, inadequate or unproductive in any way. The second thing is around flight risk. And it's something no one likes to talk about, but the truth is Saskatoon 
has always been a bit challenged to retain all of the good people we get. We get, we're, we're good for a period of time and then, you know, for very good reasons and people are mobile and they'll take their skills and talent elsewhere. They, they often will find an opportunity to move to a larger community, uh, a larger, uh, pardon me, a larger city where there are perhaps better opportunities or a larger cultural community. And so the, the question around Canadian experience, I think is loaded with a bunch of uh, questions around risk that we could probably pick out a little bit, you know? Um, when, when you can dispel the concern that um, there's going to be challenges integrating that newcomer into, into your workforce, and the, the, you know, we've kind of grown up as a city where the, where, where the flight risk isn't maybe as significant as it might have been in the past. Maybe that starts to break down some of those concerns and then people start to see, well, yes, what, what is the utility and purpose of asking a question around Canadian experience, for example? Um, where can we get links and more information on the resources you mentioned? The RBC report is available right now on your phone. It's, it, it was, it was uh, issued on Thursday. Um, it provided a pan-Canadian view, but it's not hard to look the key themes and the data there and, and extrapolate it to our, our experience here. Experience are leading towards skill-based hiring rather than credential-based hiring. Hmm. You know, I'm not familiar with that piece. I think I'd need to dig in a bit more on that one. I, I'm not familiar with skill-based versus credential-based and what would be meant by that. Was that that was what, that might have been the conversation around trades, yeah. right? So it's not a, it's not a regulated uh, profession, but nevertheless, it comes with a lot of expectations in terms of credentialing and, uh, and certification. So maybe that might be that might be the nature of that one. Sask new business could do to help new Canadians stay in Saskatoon. Some of the things I've, I've mentioned, um, I think, you know, obviously, um, you know, I think we, I, from our point of view and certainly our lane, where, where we can make the biggest contribution is helping that business owner and their family be as successful as possible and, and try and grow fast enough to employ other people. Because as I said, that's really how community gets built. And that's the opportunity that uh, I think newcomers present. Um, The employer bias against newcomers, that was the conversation we were having earlier. I think, I think we're going to take the opportunity during Welcome Week. We've already talked about how that's going to play out. That's the end of September? Yeah, and so um, the conversation initially was, well, you know, we should, do, we should have a Welcome Week for newcomers. Yes. I think, well, our contribution could be for that week would be a series of uh, workshops and panels like the ones I'm describing for uh, for employers and we could involve for example as we talked about um, hospitality Saskatchewan um, and others that are in that who are in the space of representing small and medium-sized businesses and having really like practical conversations on what we need to do to onboard more people into our uh, into our business community and into those jobs Encourage place to EDI focus in their recruitment process. Well, this is interesting. Uh, very good question. Um, how can I put this? I would say that even though it may not look like it, our SME segment, our, our small and medium sized business community, is very aware and waking up to the need to get very serious on EDI. And the reason why is that they, many of them are in the supply chains of the largest companies in this province who have set very aggressive EDI targets and have said to their suppliers, if you want to work with us, we'd like to see the same level of commitment that we're demonstrating in our company. So all of the big companies that I listed off here, from Nutrien to the Camacos to the paper excellence to whatever, all of them have now set really aggressive targets on that. 
SMEs, suppliers, are finding ways to get better at this fast. Whether they feel a moral obligation to do it or because they know that the future of their business is contingent on it. Because if you want to be a supplier to some of the biggest global companies in the world, you're going to have to get serious about it. So many, many of them are on a path, I can tell you that. Um, it, it takes time to get to a point where I think you see measurable um, differences, but the indicators are pointing up and EDI is, is something that is being taken very seriously by huge swaths of our business community because of that. Wow. Okay, guys, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me today. It was great to meet you. Thank you. Thanks.